You're listening to Me and Paranormal You with your host, Ryan Singer. It's more fun to believe. Third, third year, year bonus. And, and there it is. There it is. It has begun. It has begun once again. Once again, against all odds, it has begun. The program, Me and Paranormal You with host Ryan Singer, has begun. This is a third bonus. It's a solo episode. Okay, thank you. I don't know who that was, but thank you for doing that, that artful and artistic and uh, fanciful intro for me. It has begun. You, okay, we, we get it. We, we know it's begun. I, I, I specifically know it's begun. And I think the people listening also know it's begun. It is here. Yes, and I don't think there's been that much anticipation, but I appreciate you building it regardless. This is Ryan Singer. Welcome to Me and Paranormal You, the Paranormal Mindcast. This is a solo episode. At least it's supposed to be solo, but other people seem to be taking the microphone from me from time to time, and that will happen. That's just what happens. Today, I want to talk about skinwalkers at the Pentagon, an insider's account of the secret government UFO program. I have finished this book, so I can I can speak on this book and uh, as if someone who, who who has read it, because in fact, I have read it and I've 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 marked a lot of notes uh, or pages and things like that. A couple I've got a new system. I'll tell you about I'll tell you about this was this book was written by um, uh, James Lakatsky, Colm Kelleher, and George Knapp, and we're going to get into that. But those are the main characters of this book with uh, a couple other, you know, former agents or current agents. People will often say once CIA, always CIA, there's no such thing as retiring. Is that true? I don't know because I can't, I can't speak on that. I've never worked for the central intelligence, I should say. But, you know, who knows? Have I ever met someone in the CIA? <laughs> if I did, they didn't tell me. And we're here all week. So um, let's get to it. Before we get to it, I got to tell you, I found my, I've been, you know, I'm settling into the new mind cave and I love it. I love it. I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm exploring this place called Kenneth Hahn State Recreation Area. It's got a ton of trails. It connects. There's a trail called uh, Park to the Playa. So I could hike from this state rec area, which is, yeah, I don't know, maybe a mile and a half, two miles at the most from from the mine cave to to the beach. I haven't done that yet. It's about an eleven mile hike. I got to figure out the navigations on it. Maybe maybe I'll do it. Maybe I'll do it on Thursday. Who knows? I'm going to do it before it gets too cold. Uh, that's for sure. Because I can make it. I, I definitely can make it. I hit my old stomping grounds today at Brand Park in Glendale, California. It was a scorcher. It was in the nineties, and we loved it. There, I mean, I, I I couldn't help but just you know the phrase the universe oven the universe's oven. Uh, either one just kept ringing in my mind as I was hiking. I was in the universe's oven because here's here's basically what it boils down to. Life can be life can be exciting. Life can be beautiful. Life can be dull. Life can be sad. Life can be happy. There are these events that we experience as people as long as we're living our lives, I suppose, that bring all of these emotions simultaneously and sometimes separately and individually. Whether you're going through great times or difficult times, whether you're happy or sad or somewhere in the middle or in between or vacillating between both ends of the spectrum rapidly and seemingly with no, no course forward or, or no cause, I can offer you this. It's, it's, a, it's, it's something that a lot of us can relate to. Uh, I, I would say everyone, but I don't want to speak for everyone, but I can say I can speak for myself. I can speak for a lot of people who have shared their experiences. It's you're not alone in that. And hopefully, no matter how much of the light has been dimmed, you will you will find a, a new spark and you will find more light. Um, for me, hiking is a mental health benefit. I love being outside. I love being connected to nature. I always feel a little bit better about myself after doing exercise outside. And 
I mean, sure, in the gym too, maybe something like that. But exercise in general is good for us. But the mountain has been my uh, panacea for, I don't know, at least a decade now since I moved to California and realized I loved hiking. So over a decade now, the, the mountain, the hills, the trails, the dust, the dirt, you know, the crows, the squirrels, and all those fat daddy lizards. You know, I love a good lizard when it's running and it's got a little extra junk in a trunk and it's got that wiggle. It's got that wiggle. It's got that wiggle. Lizards got that wiggle when they run. I love the lizard wiggle. It's one of my favorite things. It doesn't matter what mood I'm in. It, and when I see the lizard wiggle, which you see it all the time out here in California because there's lizards everywhere and they're, out, they're getting their wiggle on. I love it. It, it. it brings a smile to my face. No, no matter what's happening in the world, the lizard wiggle gets me every time. I love the, the lizard wiggle. I almost called it a legal. Anyway, so, yeah, the universe's oven baked me today. Oh, goodness gracious, did it bake me. Um, but we're here. We made it. We made it through. So, um, something I haven't done in a while. Um, I got distracted. I was talking about how I'm settling in. And I, I'm, I'm almost completely settled in now. Um, I found my lost tarot of Nostradamus, the first tarot deck I ever owned. And a couple days ago, I decided to do a three-card pull. It started off as a one-card pull, turned into a three-card pull. Because I was looking for insight and potentialities about the upcoming Florida investigation, part five or whatever it's going to be. I will be returning to Florida, fingers crossed. Um, health and weather permitting health of everyone involved weather permitting for everyone involved in mid-october going back for another installment of five days five nights etc or around about that maybe six days excuse me and i wanted some insight and these are the three cards i pulled and you can't make this stuff up ladies and gentlemen um the cards cards don't lie so i pull i pull the initiate card which is uh one of the moon of the moon su suit uh, of this deck so i pull the initiate card um the initiate of moons is the night of perfect gentleness and spiritual daring in the grail story he would be galahad in the ordinary world he is an idealistic dreamer whose charms most people find hard to resist. A sense of otherworldly glamour hangs about him, a secret knowledge hidden just below the surface. As a guide, he is second to none. As a friend, he is a rock upon which you may rest in time of need. So, and then reversed, it's the opposite of all those things, right? So I pull the initiate card, right? Which kind of, you know, you get initiated into these. I was initiated into that property in 2019 through uh, terrifying through a terrifying experience you can go back and listen to that it's a, it's a 30 year bonus it's called my encounter with sasquatch next card i pull uh i can't remember the exact order these are the three cards i pull uh the apprentice hmm. the apprentice of spheres okay now this is the 11th card the initiate is the 12th right in the suit different suits this is the suit of spheres the dedication and loyalty of the apprentice is a central aspect of their function. An excellent negotiator, they may be an aspect of you or someone who helps and supports you. If you're an employer, the apprentice is your ideal associate, careful, attentive, and always ready to listen and learn. If you're a student, this card strengthens any position you hold in the issue you're addressing. And reversed, it's, you know, opposite, uh, one who meddles in others' affairs. Uh, they love to bring bad news rather than being attentive to their physical well-being they tend to be dissolute and careless and encourage illness so um that's the apprentice right the third card is of the stars suit and it's 12 also so i pulled 11 12 12. this one is cardinal of stars the knight is a good person to have on your side in a tight spot, and yet he can be ruthless and determined and knows no boundaries. His strength is great, but is often accompanied by a wildness 
and lack of discipline that can make him seem out of control. There's also a sense of innocence about him. These qualities may be present in the issue you are connected with and apply just as much to your own actions. Don't get too carried away in your eagerness to win. Reversed, uh, he becomes careless as well as carefree and makes him a risky companion. Oh my God, we're at a commercial break already. Uh, when we get back, I'm going to talk to you about these three cards and how they relate and the system and the cycle. And, and by the way, patrons, no commercials, $3 a month. And, you know, at the $1 level, you're going to get at least a, a couple commercial free each month, probably. And at the free level, you can be a free patron. You're going to get at least one every month that has no commercials. This is the new system. This is the new commercial system. You just have to, I, I just have to accept it and, and live my life. So uh, we're going to be right back. And there's about every 10 minutes, there's going to be a commercial. Just giving you the heads up. And uh, yeah, so we'll be right back talking about the lost terror of Nostradamus uh, after these brief messages. Okay, I have returned, and hopefully you have returned as well. Back to the program as the volume increases, the action rises, as they would say. And Are you watching uh, Only Murders in the Building uh, with my favorite actor combo, Steve Martin Short? Uh, and Selena Gomez is great in it as well. So, as, And also the supporting cast have, have been marvelous. Um, as well but if you look at these three cards sorry that was probably a loud thump you have the initiate who the because you typically you can think of it this way the initiate someone becomes the initiate then they become the apprentice and then they become the cardinal so it's like oh hey, what's this oh okay i'll sign up oh okay now i'm doing the job and now you're really good at the job right or you're esteemed in the job so you know from initiate to apprentice, to cardinal or slash knight, um, which I thought was very interesting. Um, you know, past, present, future, possibly, if we're going to go a standard three card, are we going to do a three card uh, read? Are we going to go, you know, the one on your left would be past, present, and no, which one was which? I can't remember. It's been a few days. So I can't remember exactly in the order in which. I pulled them. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, so I found it encouraging. I found it encouraging and actually kind of on the nose. Um, you know, if, if we maintain our current path, if we stay true to the tenets of the journey and of the search itself, it is likely, if not inevitable, that with the proper care and I don't know, even maybe companionship along the way. No one should do anything alone. No journey is ever a solo journey, truly. That we can find our expertise or our comfort or our ease in, you know, becoming more confident and comfortable in the thing it is that we are searching to become or to find or to do. And I think that's just anything in life right? Whether you're a welder, an esotericist, or, you know, a tour guide at Universal Studios and Halloween Horror Nights, you know what I mean? There are people who have been doing it for years who are brilliant at it. Uh, they are the cardinals, right? Meanwhile, there's probably brand new people who are the initiates going through training, and then there's the apprentices who have been there a minute. You know, they, they know what they're doing, kind of, but they're still learning the tricks of the trade. I think this is accurate for any kind of paranormal researcher and or investigator. This, this becomes, uh, this resonates you know, w with me in, in, in many ways, whether it's as a film editor, stand-up comedian, uh, paranormal investigator, paranormal researcher, um, you know, son, brother, uncle, I, th I think it resonates. And to me, it was a, a not-so-subtle reminder of the journey itself and to remember that there is a journey. I'd love to just decide to do something and become 
masterful at it. That would be delightful. That's just not how the world works, though, is it? We can't just, I mean, born, you're, you know, you're born brilliant at something, right? People say that uh, oftentimes. I, I think it does a disservice to the actual work that goes into it, whether the, the, whether, whether the work is public or private. There's, there's always work. There's always work happening. And someone can be naturally gifted, yes. That doesn't mean they don't, they don't work at the craft, at the craft below the art form itself. So I thought that was that was pretty cool. I'll probably do uh, more readings. That deck had been in that deck had been in uh, in in a box for way too long, uh, for the better part of a year and a half, if not longer, with all my floating happening. So you know, sometimes you have to make difficult calls about things you can keep with you. I, I mean, essentially, I was living out of a computer backpack and a medium-sized roller bag. Uh, Basically, that's what I'd been living out of for about a year and a half. So a lot of, you know, six, six of the same shirts, T-shirts, and like two or three of the same button downs. And, you know, a couple pairs of jeans. Let's not even get into the other way. That sucks. Okay, let's not even get into it. I do replenish those quite often. Not, not more than I need. I'm not wasteful. Okay, anyway, so we're going to talk about Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, an insider's account of the secret government UFO program. I have the sequel. And I will be reading it starting later tonight. And I've got about two weeks to finish uh, two or three books. And I, I definitely can do it as long as I just dedicate myself to it. So, um, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid said, Readers will be amazed and enthralled by this book. And I, I tend to agree with that sentiment. Now, here's some... I do feel like I need to say a few things about this book. There's a couple of very remarkable moments in the book that really perk your paranormal peepers, right? And they get your attention. Uh, and, and those can't be ignored. And one of the chapters focuses solely on blue orbs. And I believe I probably talked about this last week. Uh, chapter eight, blue orbs are not benign is the name of the title of that chapter. And it goes, to, you know, it talks about the autoimmune disorders and uh, the various ailments that people have experienced when having physical encounters, contact with orbs of the blue variety. So that's something to keep in mind. If you're out there doing CE5, you're sky watching, you're in a haunted location, a paranormal hot spot. You know, you're on a mystical, you know, retreat or something, and the blue orbs show up. Just try not to touch them. Try not to let them touch you. Don't freak out about it. Maybe that might draw their attention to you. I, I don't know. I'm not trying to give you good, or I'm not trying to give you bad advice here. So it just doesn't seem to be, uh, you know, a great deal. It doesn't seem to be like a good bargain when the blue orb makes physical contact with your body. Just keep that in mind. I'm hearing a noise. I think there's this microphone is so damn good it's picking up some kind of car out on the street, like car alarm or something. Anyway. Or is there a ghost in the machine? There's a ghost in your machine and it's and it's and it's and it's not restful. There's an actor who sounds like this and I can't remember his name right now. But I will tell you, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that I like this actor, and I've seen him in many things, and he usually plays a liminal character, one that's not necessarily good, but one that's not necessarily bad. And it also sounds like wonderful comedian Brett Butler a little bit, but more masculine. But I, I can I can see this actor in my mind, and I just I just wish I knew his name. Because if I knew his name, I would tell you, and I would let you know what his name is. Because that is what you're supposed to do, and that is what I would do. 
free you. Okay, we got to get off of that guy. Okay, we're getting ready to take another break here in a second. But we come back. I want to, I'm going to specifically talk about the dog man. And is the dog man in this book? You bet your sweet tush. The dog man is in this book. You can't really hear the music, but trust me, it's there, which means we need to take another quick break. And we're going to be back uh, right after these short messages. I promise to you. I promise to you. We're going to be back. And when we're back, we're going to talk about the dog man. And I, I know that's something you want to hear. And that's why I'm going to verbalize it. The dog man, right after this. Okay, we're back. And unknown actor who's been in a million movies, by the way, and you would definitely recognize him. And he kind of looks like Robert England. No, he doesn't. He doesn't look like Robert England at all, actually. That's Freddy Krueger. He looks like the guy who played T2. Oh, God, I wish I could remember his name. It's Rob or something, right? Anyway, you're probably yelling it right now at your phone or wherever you're listening to this. I'm being like, his name is Robert Paulson. And it's not Robert Paulson. That's the guy from Fight Club starring R.I.P. Meatloaf. Anyway, let's get to the good stuff here. There are multiple accounts of the dog man being seen in skinwalkers at the pentagon and we are talking about seen by the family members from this is as a result of something we've spoken about uh, in the last month or so the infectious agent effect so which means let me just remind you what that is in case you don't know what i'm talking about and you, and you haven't heard the program before people would visit skinwalker ranch and this was during OSAP. And this was even before OSAP, uh, whether it was NIDS, the NIDS research team, N-I-D-S, that's an acronym, or the OSAP research team, which was the secret government UFO program that this book is about. Not ATIP, as it was mislabeled in the media, but OSAP, right? So A-A-W-S-A-P. So, or even currently with the Secrets of Skinwalker Ranch television show, which, by the way, Travis Taylor is definitely a CIA guy, right? I mean, I think we're all on board with that. He definitely works for the CIA. And when I say definitely, I mean, that's my guess. I don't know if he does. If I met him, I, that'd be the first question I asked him. Or if I was at a conference, a Paracon, and he's there, wink, wink to anyone who goes to one of these things, and they do Q&As, just be like, hey, are you um, are you CIA? And, you know, if, if, if you ask him, he's got to tell you. You know, that's not true with... Uh, Secret spy cops, they don't have to do And I don't think it's true with regular cops either. Anyway, so John Axelrod was one of the agents who was one of the high levels, top secret, you know, spy kind of people, you know, with, you know, an ability to operate sensor equipment and things like this to try to get measurements and, you know, interrogate people or, or interview people, things like that. He was part of the, you know, the boots on the ground action team of OSAP whenever there was a high level encounter or sighting or strange anomaly happening because this program, OSAP, wasn't only about UFOs. It was about the paranormal effects associated with and occurring oftentimes simultaneously with UFO UAP reports. They were investigating the psychic and the paranormal as well as UFO sightings. They believed that there was correlation tying them all together. Right. And as you know, over here, we believe in consciousness as the foundation of all things that is brought up in this book as well from Robert Bigelow, one time owner of Skinwalker Ranch, who later sold it to Brandon uh, Fugel, uh, I believe in 2016 or 2017, who is now the owner of the ranch, you know, for this TV show that happens on, I believe it's Discovery. Nonetheless. John Axelrod has two sons. If I, if I'm, I think I'm getting this right. Two sons and a wife live in the suburbs of Virginia, right? Most of the agents and people that would go out and visit were all East Coast. You got to be over by Charlottesville. You know it's in Charlottesville. We talk about this all the time. Something weird's happening in Charlottesville. And there's just all these government people in there because of its proximity to, I don't know, Langley and... Washington, D.C., I suppose. I mean, is that the place? Do we need to move the mind cast? Does the mind cave need to be somewhere 
outside Charlottesville, so we can so we can do what so we can talk about government workers uh, from a closer distance to where they they live. I don't really see why it would do it would behoove us. Oh, got to use the word behoove. It's been a while. It's been a while since I've used the word behoove. It's been a while since I could see the word behoove. Any stained fans? Uh, uh, no, I'm not saying I'm a fan, but I that song, something about it. So talk about the dog man. Okay, I, I will. John Axelrod's wife, at one point, she was the first person during the daytime. I believe it was the daytime. Maybe in the evening or night. Looks out the window of the house. Virginia suburbs. Keep in mind, suburbs. Virginia. There is a wolf-like creature standing on its hind legs by a tree, staring with menacing intent inside the house at his wife. She sees this strange wolf-like creature standing on its hind legs, and then it runs off into the woods, you know, suburb woods, you know, whatever those are, on its hind legs, not like a wolf does, but like a wolf person, or like a wolf man, or like a dog man. She mentions nary a word about this experience and about what she witnessed not wanting people to think she's crazy or and or raise alarm bells important aspect of this is this was after her husband john axelrod's visits to skinwalker ranch this has happened after he has visited the property. That's why they're calling it the infectious agent model. They compare it to a contagion, right? So not necessarily the people who go to the ranch, but when they come back, the people around them get infected, quote unquote, with this paranormal, strange happening, contagion, shadow figures, Hovering over their bed, they wake up and there are shadow figures staring at them. Loud noises in the kitchen and in the steps happening in the house. When up until the first visit of the person that they are closely connected to, no paranormal activity. None of this stuff. Oh, <coughs> excuse me. Speaking of contagions. Excuse, I gotta edit this out, but I, I really just, I like the podcast to be raw, so I'm, I'll just leave my sneezes in. Excuse me for such rude behavior that I can't control. So all these paranormal happenings and strange happenings in the house, shadow figures, weird noises, poltergeist activity, etc., things flying across the room for another agent after the person close to them has visited Skinwalker Ranch. Now, the person who visits Skinwalker Ranch, strangely, typically, does not experience such a thing. Um, or, or they don't, you know, it's, I don't know, it's hard to pinpoint. It's hard to pin down exactly what this all means, right? Is it because they were hyper-exposed? Now they bring traces of it back and the people around them who are not expecting in any way, shape, or form to see or experience anything paranormal, psychic, or strange, or cryptid, now are doing that. So the wife sees Dogman. We're going to say Dogman. We're going to, it's mentioned in this book. Written by the people who worked for the government in the secret UFO program. For the DIA. Keep that in mind. They're the ones, their words, not mine. Cut to very soon after that, the two sons see a wolf like creature standing on its hind legs in broad daylight, if I'm not mistaken, in broad daylight, like leaning up against a tree, just kind of looking at him in the house or something. And obviously it freaks them out. And then the dog man 
runs into the woods or runs off and disappears on two legs. Not how wolves run. I just watched that movie, Wolves, starring Brad Pitt and George Clooney. Really enjoy those two together. Their friendship shines through. Gosh, it's a time for a commercial break. So there's some dogman stuff right there, right? And when we get back, we're going to talk more about what that means, what to expect. And do I have any concerns about being an infectious agent uh, on my trips to Mutilation Ranch and the Florida location? We're going to talk more about that as soon as we get back. We're about the halfway point of the Minecast right now. I I hope you're enjoying this. Uh, We're going to be right back. And we are back. And I got to tell you, the uh, the idea that the infectious agent model is obviously very real is a little bit troublesome to some degree when one who loves to, is driven to, and can't help but keep visiting places that I would compare to Skinwalker Ranch, in fact, with the levels of activity that are happening at these places, uh, specifically, specifically Mutilation Ranch in Colorado and the Florida location, which I will be and just in about two and a half weeks, I'll be uh, flying and going back down there. So up, up until this point, uh, I think it's important to say that if I have been an an infectious agent spreading a paranormal contagion when I get back from these places to those close to me and around me, they haven't mentioned it. And I haven't heard anything in my old apartment. Um, You know, I haven't heard anything here or... Now, that is not to say that there wasn't some weird activity back in Dayton. A little bit, not, you know, either the weird phone call I got from uh, a person while I'm editing the documentary. I mean, there is some, there are some things like that. But nothing, no shadow figures hovering over people while they're sleeping. At least if, if so, they never, they never brought it up to me. And I got to tell you, those conversations would come up regularly when I'm around. Um, friends of the family or friends of friends once they find out how into the paranormal and et cetera, et cetera, investigations, the podcast, they want to talk about this stuff constantly and they want to share stories or they're, they're looking, they have questions and you would be surprised how many people believe in Bigfoot on the DL. There are lots of DL down low Bigfoot believers out there and it actually warms my heart. Um, to know that but so does it worry me that I might bring something like this back Uh, heretofore it has not I'm not reading this book I don't want to be implanted with fear placed into my mind I'm not trying to manifest this now suddenly because I read it in a book but um, obviously Skinwalker Ranch is different than the places I am visiting and investigating even though I think they're very similar they are not the same place So, different places, you know, one portal at a time, as we like to say over here on the show. Now, what's interesting also in in regards to all of this is that all of this has been cleared by the Department of Defense, etc., to be in these books and to be released to the public. And this book specifically has been out for a minute. Um, Let's see if I can find the original publication date. Um... Yeah, cleared for public release May 11th, 2021. Three, over three years ago, the Department of Defense, Defense Office of Pre-Publication and Security Review, uh, and even has a case number, case 20-SB-0058. The views expressed in this publication are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Department of Defense or the U.S. government. Okay, the public release clearance of this publication by the Department of Defense does not imply Department of Defense endorsement or factual accuracy of the material. Where appropriate, in order to protect personally identifiable information 
PII, and protect and protected health information, PHI, names and personal details have been changed, which makes sense. So, this is a book that has cleared for release. Uh, that's all, you know, I think it's, 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 it's interesting. You're right. I've got, I'm, I'm killing time here while I, uh, I've got three bookmarks stickered to this page. Um, this is something really kind of fascinating to me. I mean, the whole book is fascinating and I recommend giving it a read if you're into that kind of thing. Um, but they did something that I was unfamiliar with and I've never, and now granted I have, I've only heard maybe a couple of the interviews with Klatsky and Kelleher and George Knapp about all this, but um, I hadn't heard it in the things that were brought up. And something interesting that Lukatsky and Kelleher are saying in these interviews, especially the one with George Knapp and Jeremy Corbell on, I forget the name of their podcast, but it's something like pretty, like, it's got one of those kind of names, you know, like, you know, bullets in, bullets in the ether, or, or it's something like that, right? Anyway, so, but it's a very good interview, and it's a long interview, but Lukatsky keeps saying people are asking the wrong questions. They're not asking the right questions. They're not asking, people aren't asking the right questions. And about the aliens and the UFOs, etc. And I've always, you know, in the moment of, of hearing him say that, I was like, oh yeah, they're not asking when is this happening? Um, like in time, space. I mean, you know, like when is it happening? It's like, well, no, we know when it's happening. No, 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 no. But truly, when is this happening, right? So what time did this happen and what period or what time, you know what I mean? Like when in the timeline are they bending timelines, which I believe is, is, is highly plausible. Anyway, so back to this, this is uh, page 133. They're talking about communication experiments. Um, it's, and I cannot find these. I cannot find these, uh, these reports as far as I can, as far as I can tell have not been cleared and released to the internet on, FOA, or Freedom of Information Act. Um, as always, shout out to theblackvault.com. I've got um, a bunch of the OSAP documents, at least the one, the DIRDs, um, that have been released um, from, you know, Freedom, Freedom of Information Act requests. So, but this one not. These this this specific monthly report that came out, I believe it was the April or May of 2021 report. I, I no, it's uh, we'll find that we'll find that later. But uh, if anyone out there listening knows otherwise, please inform me ASAP about OSAP. Get me ASAP on OSAP because I'd love the specifics of this. Commu of, of what they're doing here because I've got some ideas I want to do. And there has been, th these are things that people, paranormal investigators have done in haunted homes, in haunted locations for, for years, right? On a very basic level, but it's never been restricted access um, to the space, I, I mean, right? At least in, in a, like an official capacity. And you'll understand what I'm saying here in one second, I promise. They do com communication experiments. Let me just read from this section for you. The intent behind communication experiments was to test the hypothesis that some agency that appeared to exhibit intelligence was responsible for the 20-year history of anomalies on Skinwalker Ranch. Secondly, during the term of the NIDS presence on Skinwalker Ranch, 1996 to 2002, some early success had been achieved with the use of games and puzzles. Oh, that gets my attention. And because I live in a game house right now, uh, one of my housemates, Grant Lyon, very funny comedian, is huge in the board game world and creates board games and, you know, invents his own that, go, that are being sold. And constantly, and he gets like three board games mailed to him every day people wanting him to review. He does Grant's game reviews. Grant's game recs, I believe, is what the TikTok and Instagram account is. Uh, you can check it out. But um, So we're playing game. We played a game today. It had aliens in it. <laughs> you know I like that. 
Okay, so anyway, um, so they had some success with this in 1996 to 2002, the NIDS team. And this was the team that Robert Bigelow put together on his own property when he owned it. The, NID, the NIDS team had found on a couple occasions that games patterns that had been left in a controlled environment with no human present would be interfered with and new patterns created that involved moving game components in an apparently non-random manner. Such activity was observed in a small number of cases when interference by humans, animals, seismic effects, or weather had been ruled out. The majority of the communication strategies on Skimwalker Ranch used by Bass, Bigelow, Aero, not aeronautics and aerospace company or something were traditional involved the initiation of a variety of games puzzles and other approaches in order to establish communication a pre lock game or puzzle would be set up in a location that would not be disturbed by human or animal no access to the game was possible without keys that were housed in las vegas a thousand a couple thousand miles away or actually you know not that far far enough um they'd photograph the initial uh, configuration and then re-photograph again later uh and i'm gonna put a bow on this when we get back from yet another commercial break uh, we're gonna be right back i promise uh we're just a hop skip and a jump away from you know getting the cherry on top of this soda sunday i say soda okay we're back we're talking about the communication experiments at Skinwalker Ranch. We're talking about how they used games and puzzles in a locked, controlled environment. They would photograph the original configuration, and then they would photograph later when they went back in to check on it. And some of these would be reconfigured with apparently intelligent intelligence behind the reconfiguration. If any component of the game had moved during the previous 24 hours, the movement would be detectable by comparing the before and after photographs. The strategy and data from these communication games were described in the 360-page report entitled Utah Ranch Investigation, August 2009, February 2010, delivered to DIA in April 2010. I can't get that report yet. I want that report. I want to read that report because I love games. I love games. I want to hear how they played their games. Um, because, you know, it sounds like it would be a really cool read to figure out what games were they were they moving and playing. And so I have an idea. Um, do you take the best game of all time, in my opinion, and almost everyone alive disagrees with me uh, about this statement I'm getting ready to make? The game Risk, the game of global domination. <laughs> I love the board game Risk. I do. I haven't played it in years now, but I just enjoy it. I love it very much. Many people despise it, and they think it's not a very good game. Uh, we agree to disagree in, in that regard. But I will be taking or picking up or purchasing a couple games because I, 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 I love this idea, and I'm just going to steal it from them. I'm going to copy this in some way the question is what game which strategy puzzle game could we use and that's why i think there have to be maybe one two or three i'm going to bring in an expert a games expert my buddy grant before i go and see which ones he would suggest to use in these experiments when we go back to florida and i cannot wait to share those results with you at some point. If anything exciting or fun happens with that, you know I'll be telling you about it. And I and you know, and some of you might be wondering, well, you know, you talk about Florida all the time. You've been going, this will be your third basically week-long trip to the location. So, what gives? Am I ever going to be able to see anything or or whatever from Florida? And the answer is yes. Uh, the timeline is ambiguous. I don't know what the timeline is, but I think I've mentioned this previously. I am finished for the most part. We're just waiting on the music. It's being scored right now by our buddy Justin Freema. But, and, you know, that, it's going to take a couple of weeks. You know, you don't want to rush it just to have it done. But I am currently revisiting, and I have started doing this, 
there's a god i don't even want to admit how many years ago it was it was five years ago the last time i looked at it my comedy paranormal memoir that i'm tentatively calling shapeshifter um a stand-up comedian's journey into belief right um and it's about comedy and it's about the paranormal and it's about my journey from comedy into the paranormal and vice versa etc cetera, etc cetera. and about a life being a comedian just living in that on the road space and the liminal space you know being a floater things like that so i'm very excited about that so i'm going over that right now i've actually started going back over that book and the timeline for that is by middle of january i will have a product that i'm either trying to sell and or self-publish depending on how that goes so that will be out the project following that will be the book i'm writing about my friend carolyn and well, you know i believe that'll be the project that follows we haven't that nothing set in stone but then it's the florida documentary because by then I'll, we'll probably have another trip after this one even in the bag or i'll have a lot more research done at that point and i'll be able to wrap my brain more around concepts or i'll just know more to make the movie what it should be the original trip in 2019 there will be very very little footage from that trip just because of the nature of some of the footage is missing uh which <laughs> it breaks my heart that some of it's missing it shatters it shatters my heart really i mean there is footage of me and ed walking on the trail cam right before my experience there's footage of the flashlight dancing on the sugar shack all that trail cam footage is missing and it breaks my freaking heart it does i tell you i wish i had that footage and who knows maybe yet i will find it it's on a hard drive or a computer somewhere that doesn't work anymore at ed brown's house then uh so there's gonna be very little of that but there are other trips that we've been making we even made trips last year we made a trip last year if i'm not mistaken or do i do i misremember i don't even know anymore right nonetheless we got a lot of footage and i'm going to be editing that together into a documentary and i'm excited to be sharing that whenever that'll be done i don't know end of next year is probably a favorable timeline to think of it in that way so and that's if i really bust my ass i mean because we just have so much footage that we've accumulated and there's so many things that have happened out there so what is the st the story is still unfolding so i don't want to tell an incomplete story i mean the story will always be incomplete but you know you have to give it a little more time and you know we're we're we're, we're ain't we're going towards something and i i feel like we're on the verge or i've already had you know some pretty remarkable breakthroughs in the investigation there so who knows what's going to happen but just a couple more things from skinwalkers at the pentagon um you know the oh and there's world ce5 day happening I, you know what i should you know forgive me but i'm gonna i'm gonna do a no-no <clears throat> there's a bug flying around i'm gonna in real time instead of doing this in advance i'm gonna look up uh dr stephen greer's um you can i don't have my phone silenced um his instagram and find out when the uh, world ce5 day is uh because we're all gonna you know if you don't have the ce5 app i i recommend it um i recommend it to you june 6 um no 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 these are old um those are old updates um gosh i'm so i apologize this is just not great tv right now is it uh the lost century free market um you know he's always got something going on um there is a ce5 day where everybody's gonna be doing ce5 together and let's see if i can find it yeah here it is global ce5 day saturday october 5th this saturday is global ce5 day uh bring your ce5 app link in bio and reach out to the stars and universal peace so um oh actually this is going to work out perfect because i'm supposed to get together with a friend of mine i haven't seen in a long time since i've been out of town and uh uh we're supposed to hang out on saturday so um this will be perfect um sell tickets online no, i'm not going to do that i can just use the app and kind of figure out what time it's happening and then just kind of join in um but i think it would be interesting october 5th saturday ce5 
a, a global CE5 event. If you've never tried CE5, I recommend at least peeping on the app, look into it, see if it interests you, and if so, maybe buy it. Do you want me to post all of the protocols and things like that on the Patreon so you don't have to pay for it? I would feel like I'm stealing it and then propagating it. But how about this? I'll make a deal with you right now. If there are, oh God, I don't remember how much the app costs and, and, I'm, and I'm broke. Um, but okay, here's what we'll do. I'm going to give away at least one of them, all right? I will give away the app to somebody who doesn't have it and maybe they don't think they can afford it. The first person who messages me about wanting the CE5 app, I'll just Venmo you whatever it costs so you can get it. How about that? And then, you know, I do have a windfall coming. I, I, can't, I can't really put my finger on it, but something grand, the universe is, the universe is up to something, right? And it's, it's related to my work. And so then I'll be able to gift the app to everyone who wants it. Anyway, so the first person who reaches out to me that wants the CE5 app, I will Venmo you for that. Um, you know, early birds. I guess if you listen to the show and you're an early bird, you listen to it when it first come out, you're gonna, you have the upper hand in this situation. We're going to be right back. This is the final commercial break of the program. And then we're just going to bring this. We're going to bring this baby. Uh, we're going to bring it, bring the baby to the, the universal home. And we're going to talk, we're going to, some more final thoughts on skinwalkers at the Pentagon and more. And we're back. Okay, I get to put my reading glasses back on in my blue light protectors. My optometrist would be, which by the way, I don't know my optometrist's name. I went to a lens crafter's once, right? I got a prescription for these reading glasses a few years ago. Um, they have something called a data warehouse that they've built during the OSAP program. And it sounds bonkers. Like a collection of like Project Blue Book. It's just basically in from multiple countries, all the UFO, UAP sightings and every just a searchable database of everything. I mean, whew, to be able to get in there and, and snoop around would be amazing. Uh, it should be a public data. It should be it should be a public database, in my opinion. But here's here's what I wanted to talk about. I know a lot of people love MUFON, uh, Mutual UFO Network. And you know, there's people who are members of MUFON, and I was a member of UPARS, which was uh, UFO Paranormal Research Society, which formerly was Los Angeles chapter of MUFON. They broke off because MUFON wanted to limit their researches to only UFOs. And I don't know, I have my suspicions that there were other reasons that they broke off as well, and we don't need to get into those because, and actually my suspicions time up with exactly what we're talking about here. OSAP got together with, and Bigelow was involved in all of this because it was his, it was Bigelow's company that got the contract for OSAP. So Bigelow's company was his contracting, government contracting company, aerospace company, was had the contract, was being paid $22 million to head up this research project, this secret government UFO program. Bigelow already knew Lukatsky previously before getting the contract. Um, they got the contract from the government website that puts up contracts for contractors to make bids on. They were the only one who bid on it. Interesting, right? $22 million just sitting out there. One company bids on it. It's Bigelow who already knows everybody involved. This is all very insulated, is what I'm saying. It feels all very, very inside baseball, as we'd say. Seems to be a close, a close group of friends, right, who kind of all know each other through, through work in cursory ways, right? And I'm not saying they were BFFs, but when you read this book, Bigelow is, he's propped up in this book, and only the brightest and most glorious of light is shown on Robert Bigelow throughout the course of Skinwalkers at the Pentagon because George Knapp wrote the book and George Knapp is BFFs with Robert Bigelow. Now, 
did James Lukatsky write the book? Did Colm Kelleher, PhD, write the book? Um, yes, they all wrote the book. But my guess is that George Knapp, the journalist, the professional journalist, is the one who did the bulk of the writing of the book, right? That's my guess. I could be 100% incorrect on that. Anyway, what I'm saying is all of this is very insulated. These are all kind of guys who already knew each other, right? And it seems a little too convenient that Bass is the only, Bigelow's company is the only one who bids on this program. And he's got the personal property that would just be the perfect, like, lab, research lab for this specific program. You see what I'm getting at? It was always going to be Bigelow. It was always going to be Skinwalker Ranch. Right? It always was. Now, let's lay out a timeline. Can we lay out a timeline here? Now, um, I should have written this down because, uh, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hate myself for not laying this down. Uh, when the years of OSAP actually occurred, I have very high sneaking suspicions of the timeline here. Skinwalker Ranch, from what I can take away from reading this book, was not the only location that they researched as part of OSAP, the secret government UFO program. Now, okay, I'm going to have to do a little more research on this. I, I kind of I bit off more than I could chew just now. And I cannot believe that I just don't have this written. It wasn't the, one of the first things I've written down because I've suspected this for the entirety of it. Ever since I learned about OSAP, I have suspected, let me just let the cat out of the bag, and here I know what I'm going to say. I have suspected that the Florida location, and specifically the <sighs> other locations as well, uh, have been probably under the umbrella of OSAP, have been investigated, and are probably continuing to be investigated under different acronyms. The government loves their acronyms. So, so the birth of OSAP, um, gosh, here it is. Uh, okay, it all started in 2005, The Hunt for the Skinwalker, Hunt for the Skinwalker, written by Colm Kelleher and George Knapp, okay? Names sound familiar, right? Well, two of those authors also wrote this book, and it, which was published 16 years later. Now, apparently, Hunt for the Skinwalker was... Um, the the uh, the inspiration for OSAP. So it makes sense that you're going to Skinwalker Ranch, right? I'm not saying it's like it's a boys club and like we're you know we're the only ones who are smart enough to know how to do all this. And there might be a little bit of that, but you know who knows. So let's see here. Um, golly, I'm sorry, I'm making you go through this. But yeah, it's a, it's a, in two 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 two. two. Wow. I'm going to figure this crap out later. MUFON. I was talking about MUFON. I got, I got so distracted. In this book, they implicitly say that MUFON signed a contract with OSAP and with Bass, uh, or with Bass through OSAP, to share their database, their UFO witness database, their reporting database. A civilian, a private UFO reporting system, MUFON, was now contract in contract with the government. So basically what I'm saying here is if you report anything to MUFON, you are reporting it directly to the government. That is, they have basically, in my opinion, and this is a very shallow water opinion here, they've just become a front for government collection. And you see this a lot in the world of the paranormal. There is one person who's always mentioned when it comes to DNA samples uh, that you find in the wild. And, uh, you know, the founder of the BFRO, is the one telling everybody, you got to send your DNA samples to this one spot, right? Um, 
you know, and that person I can, I can tell you is affiliated with the government for sure. Now, in, in what capacity, who knows? And, you know, what's their motivation? I don't know. I'm sure they're just trying to do work on anomalous DNA research, right? Trying to figure out answers. But here's the thing. The government makes everything about war. It makes everything about national security. And you know over here on this program where we're tired of it. We are so sick and tired of this gatekeeping BS that is national security. We got to get into a skiff and we have to talk about secrets in our, in our soundproof fort. It's like, okay, you think you're the only ones who are supposed to allow to have this information. I'm so sick and tired of it. I know a lot of people are. A lot of people are sick and tired of this whole national security. We get to have the secrets. No, you work for us. It is our tax money that funds your 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 secret programs okay don't forget that they are we are entitled to this information not only do we deserve it we're entitled to it we have funded it collectively right some of us pay more taxes than others and the rich people don't even pay taxes they don't even pay taxes. It's all of us middle class, poor people that are funding these secret programs that the rich get paid to do with their companies. They're billionaires like Bigelow. Bigelow's a billionaire with his own private space company and his own consciousness study foundation, right? Um, I mean, Bigelow's on the right track and has been for a long time, that consciousness plays a much bigger part in all of this than maybe we anticipated years ago. And that, that's even, that's mentioned in the book uh, more than a few times. And obviously it, it set off some alarm bells for me. They get it. They know what they're doing. They, they realize that consciousness, they even mentioned Bernard Kastrup. I believe I'm probably butchering his name. I have one of his books here, uh, he's one of the, the modern thinkers and writers and philosophers on idealism, that consciousness is the foundation of the universe and everything else emanates from that. And through that, everything is possible and connected. And I'm on board with that. And it sounds like they are already on board with that as well. And through scientific, rigorous scientific research and all the fanciest equipment $22 million could ever buy you, they're talking about consciousness. And that to me is very profound and something to pay attention to. So think about your consciousness if you can even wrap your brain around that. See, that was a triple. That was a triple. Think about consciousness. Wrap your brain around it. Anyway, wrap your mind around the idea that consciousness is much bigger than we maybe have anticipated in the past and that consciousness is the key and that your thoughts your power to build the universe around you the imaginal world right consciousness is potentially fueling interdimensional travel think about that so when you consider that not only are our thoughts capable potentially of fueling interdimensional travel through space-time what do you think they do when we're filling our minds with self-hating thoughts on a regular basis we are building a world that hates us gosh we have to think better we have to think more lovingly right Talk to your water, love your water, love your food, love yourself, love your skin, thank yourself, be grateful, be gracious, have breakthroughs maybe, travel through space time. I'm gonna go on the astral plane tonight and I'm just gonna zip around. I have decided that that's what will happen. So it shall. Am I coming untethered? Am I spinning off the globe? Oh, who could ever know? I don't have any shows on the road, but uh, I thank you for listening. RyanSingerComedy.com, Patreon.com backslash Ryan Singer. I hope to see you at the watering hole on the astral plane.